My topic, as you know, and as Yaron said, is the moral and the practical. And it's an issue that I think repays careful thought, careful reflection. It repays revisiting this issue. It's certainly a central issue in philosophy and about morality. It may have been the first issue that you thought deeply about when you first discovered Ayn Rand and objectivism. It often is the first issue that people really think about. Is Howard Rourke moral or practical? He seems simultaneously neither and both. We recently had 29 interns at ARI, and these were the kinds of questions they were asking about the Fountainhead, and the kinds of questions they were asking about their own lives in very personal terms, about thinking about the issue of the moral and the practical. Now, today, of course, the kind of cultural bromide, um, the received wisdom, is that the moral and the practical conflict. You might be able to get some kind of reconciliation between the two, but tensions will always remain between the moral and the practical. And that's the general issue that I'm going to talk about. But my lecture really is only a sketch of some issues that are relevant to thinking about the moral and the practical. It's a big topic. And I'm going to just be emphasizing certain aspects, highlighting certain aspects that come out of objectivism about this, and that I think repay kind of careful thinking and revisiting on your own um, outside of the lecture hall, outside of the classroom. So this is what I propose to do. I'm going to talk a bit about um, the source, sort of the theoretical or philosophical source of the dichotomy. And then in particular, some of its corrosive effects on thinking of how it warps or distorts a mind um, and about thinking both about morality and practicality. Um, and hopefully that will give you a bit better understanding of people's general views about this issue and maybe even help you spot remnants of the dichotomy in your own thinking um, and, and your own thinking about philosophy. And in particular, what I'm going to stress, sorry, this is the aspect that I'm going to stress in the talk. I'm going to stress that the fact that the moral practical dichotomy, the prevalence of that dichotomy, what it does is it depersonalizes. It depersonalizes morality and practicality. It renders them non-personal. Neither one is about you. So that's one aspect that I'm going to highlight. And then I'm going to try to highlight two very, in a way, very simple points from objectivism about steps one can take to make the issue personal again. So to make it about you. Now, obviously, objectivism has a lot to say about the whole issue of the moral and the practical. I mean, the whole morality is about achieving your life and life as the standard. Um, so it's, this issue is all over and it, its whole approach to morality. But I'm going to focus on this issue of making both the concepts of morality and practicality personal again. So, and I'm going to highlight two points that I found particularly helpful about, uh, from objectivism about this issue. And then the third thing I'll do is issue some points of clarification and address some possible uh, issues of caution or warning. Now, if you're not a newcomer to Rand and objectivism, you might think the answer to this issue is now obvious. Well, of course, the moral and the practical don't conflict. The moral is the practical. And if you underline and bold the is, the moral is the practical, then the issue is really clear. <clears throat> now, what I'm going to suggest in the talk is that this really is an issue worth thinking more about that it should be an issue that is always alive in one's mind, something that one's constantly learning more about. From a different angle, that's going to be kind of the theme or the basic point of the talk. And to give you a sort of teaser of why there might be more to learn, I'm going to give you three examples that I'm only going to come back to at the end of the talk. Um, and there are examples more from the political arena, and most of what I'll be talking about is from the non-political arena. Uh, um, but these examples, they have the virtue of likely, hopefully one or two of them at least, of the three being familiar. And tomorrow, Dr. Brooke, in his talk, is going to cover some of these issues, I think, in more depth. So they also allow me to just briefly treat them at the end. 
but they're all examples that I think there's a sort of error in them, and they all, the error stems from a misunderstanding or a confusion about the issue of the moral and the practical. So here's the first example. Have you ever seen or said um, the following, some coming from our side? X, and you can fill in the blank, X is not only moral, it's also practical. More open immigration, say, is not only moral, it's also practical. Now, I think as a general rule, that's not a good way to formulate the issue. It confuses the relation of the moral and the practical, and I'll come back to that, as I say, at the end of the talk. So that's one example. It's not only moral, it's also practical. A second example. Have you ever said or seen the following sort of argument from our side? What we need American businessmen to do is embrace profits and just stop feeling guilty. If they would just lose the guilt, the unearned guilt, all would be well. Now, I think, again, if you really understand the relation of the moral and the practical, that that way of looking at things can't be correct or fully correct. It can't be the full story as stated. That's a second example. A third example. Everyone should want to practice capitalism because under capitalism, everyone is better off. This, too, I think, gets the relation of the moral and the practical wrong. And they all, I think, commit a similar type of error. They all approach the issue in too impersonal or too conventional a way. And part of the lecture, what I'm going to touch on, is why there's a tendency to be too conventional on this issue. Okay, so those are three examples, and as I said, I'll come back to those. They're more from the political arena, and I'll come back to them um, at the end of the talk. But what I want to start with, as I said, is a little bit about the theoretical or the philosophical source of this dichotomy. So sort of the moral or, moral or the philosophical, it's really the philosophical root of the moral practical dichotomy. So let me talk a little bit about that. Now, notice that there's a perspective from which this whole issue and this whole conflict seems strange, bizarre. What counts as practical depends on what you're trying to practice. As Dr. Peikoff writes in Opar, quote, the practical is that which reaches or fosters a desired result, close quote. Now, doesn't any moral code, whatever the code is, doesn't any moral code tell you what results to desire, what you should be seeking, what you should be going after? In this sense, isn't it telling you what to practice and therefore what counts as practical? How could there be a conflict let alone an inherent or an inevitable conflict between the moral and the practical. Now, if you ask that kind of question, I think it suggests, it leads you right to what the source of the dichotomy is. It's a divided reality requiring a divided focus or divided allegiances. <clears throat> so metaphysically, it requires some kind of two-world or two-realm view where you're supposed to render unto Caesar's what is Caesar's, and unto God what is God's. So the moral and the practical can diverge and even conflict because they're trying to specify what to practice in two different realms. And so you get all the familiar metaphysical dualities along with their epistemological and moral ones. You get this world versus the next world, matter versus spirit, and then sense perception versus abstractions, reason versus emotion, body versus soul, and the practical versus the moral. So the real root of the moral practical dichotomy, and I don't think this should be surprising, is the supernaturalism and mysticism of religion. So altruism is not really the root of the dichotomy. I, I think of it more as altruism cashes in on the dichotomy and gives it a secular, mystical characterization, or it's a secular, mystical reinforcer of the moral, practical dichotomy. And in that context, I think what's crucial about altruism 
is that it trains a person's mind to split reality into two conflicting realms. Not necessarily two, one supernatural, but two conflicting realms, the you and the non-you. This is a major point of emphasis in Galt's speech. Let me quote a little bit, a couple of passages. <clears throat> quote, your code demands as man's first proof of virtue that he accept his own depravity without proof. It demands that he start not with a standard of value, but with a standard of evil, which is himself, by means of which he is then to define the good. The good is that which he is not. And a little bit later in the speech, you must not question their right to your sacrifice or the nature of their wishes and their needs. Their right is conferred upon them by a negative, by the fact that they are non-you. Close quote. And it's in that way, I think, that altruism trains us mentally and metaphysically to divide the world into two, into two realms, the you and the non-you. I think of this point this way. Almost invariably, when I'm on TV or radio discussing moral issues, the host at some point has a knee-jerk reaction, something to the effect of, what about the poor kids in Africa? <clears throat> now, notice that that's not actual thinking about poor kids in Africa, of what explains their plight, of what made development possible in the West and other parts of East, East Asia, of what lifts people out of poverty, of why they so desperately need capital and capitalism. I characterize it as a knee-jerk reaction on purpose. It amounts to saying, whoa, wait a minute. Aren't you forgetting a whole realm, a whole aspect of reality, the non-you and its commandments? <clears throat> So I think you can't understand the real grip that the moral practical dichotomy has on people's minds unless you see it as a metaphysical viewpoint, even if that metaphysics is secularized. It's still a metaphysical viewpoint, and it's very hard to change people's metaphysical views. <clears throat> so that's a little bit on the source, the, sort of the philosophical root of the moral practical dichotomy. It comes from religion, and altruism secularizes the religious metaphysics. Now I want to turn to some of the destructive consequences on our thinking, on people's thinking about morality as a result of the moral practical dichotomy. And I'm going to highlight two, that it freezes the concept of morality, and it degrades our conceptions of morality and practicality, and it's really the second I really want to emphasize. So it freezes the concept of morality, and it degrades the conception of practicality. So take the first of it, freezing the concept. By removing morality from the daily job of living, by placing it in the next world, or in the realm of the non-you, it leaves you without daily guidance. Daily life becomes, in Galt's metaphor, an uncharted wilderness. I mean, who actually thinks about poor kids in Africa when acting day to day? So morality, in effect, is relegated to the addict, at best, to the addict of one's mind. No longer an active concern, no longer something one regularly thinks about, no longer a subject which one explores and learns more and more about. This is one of the reasons why people equate morality with altruism, that they treat these two terms as synonymous, unable to even entertain the possibility of another view in ethics, a concept that no longer functions in one's mind as a tool of cognition, as a lens through which one explores the world, and as a file folder in which one stores more and more information, is a frozen abstraction. That's what a frozen abstraction is. So that's one of the really detrimental consequences of the moral practical dichotomy. It freezes the concept of morality. It turns it into a frozen abstraction in one's mind. <clears throat> and that fact, along with 
really people's unwillingness to fully face the inhuman meaning of altruism leads to a second effect. So the fact that it's frozen and the fact that people can't fully face what altruism means leads to a second really destructive effect. It, you can put it this way, it crisscrosses the wires of one's mind and distorts one un one's understanding of good and evil and of practicality and impracticality. Listen to how Galt describes the process and think of the consequences he names aren't all too familiar in people's attitudes and questions today. Again, two passages from the speech. Quote, in that fog of switching definitions, which descends upon a frozen mind, you have forgotten that the evils damned by your creed were the virtues required for living. And you have come to believe that actual evils or the practical means of existence. Forgetting that the practical evil was production, you believe that robbery is practical. And he's really stressing how degraded a concept of the practical people have. It's the second passage. Morality, morality to you is a phantom scarecrow made of duty, of boredom, of punishment, of pain. A scarecrow standing in a barren field waving a stick to chase away your pleasures. And pleasure to you is a liquor-soggy brain, a mindless slut, the stupor of a moron who stakes his cash on animals' races, since pleasure cannot be moral. Close quote. So by removing any concern with one's own life from morality, it empties and degrades the concept of morality. And by removing any concern with moral values from the concept of practicality or one's conception of practicality, it degrades the concept of the practical. <clears throat> so it destroys both or undermines both. I mean, how many times have you been in a discussion with people? And if you say something to the effect that morality is about practicality, you get the response, well, why not become a bank robber then? Now, notice that in one sense, the person giving you this response doesn't really believe what he's saying. There's not really a danger of him becoming a thief, embarking on that as his life project. And he's not really even tempted by the possibility. But in another sense, in a psychoepistemological sense, he does half believe what he's saying. This is where his mind goes when he has to call up content for his concept of practicality. <clears throat> And now that's a debased conception of the practical. And that's part of what the moral practical dichotomy does. So in its worst form, what it does to the concept of the practical is equates it with genuine evil. <clears throat> now, if it hasn't reached that kind of level of um, degradation in a person's mind, then I think the more typical manifestation is a conception of practicality that is amoral, so emptied of moral values, and conventional, completely conventional. And in America, the philosophy that drives home the idea, this idea and this way of degrading the concept of the practical, of equating it with the conventional, is pragmatism. I heard it a little bit. Pragmatism. Of all the anti-mine aspects of pragmatism, one of the worst is its conception of the practical. Just do what works. Well, how do I know what works? And at a much deeper level, what counts as working? Doesn't that depend on what I'm trying to achieve? On what I should be trying to achieve? On what my goals and values should be? The ones that I want to practice in life? Those aren't practical questions, pragmatism answers. So pragmatism is a recipe, and I really think it's designed to produce conformity and abject second-handedness. At a fundamental level, it removes from a person's mind the very idea that he can think first-handedly about his goals and whether they are, in fact, desirable, whether there's something he should desire. Pragmatism tells him, in effect, the goals are here. How did they get here? Somehow. What should I do? Try to achieve some of them, whatever they happen to be. <clears throat> Which in the end means, when in Rome, do as the Romans do. 
Now, that's an utterly conventional and impersonal view of what to do. I mean, the conventional is the impersonal when it's just taken over in this kind of way. So the effect, or at least the effects that I'm highlighting of the moral practical dichotomy, is to freeze one's conception and concept of morality and to debase one's conception of practicality. As an adult, I think typical manifestations of this are these, that it means one spends too little time thinking about morality and one equates the practical with the conventional. Missing from both notions, the notion of morality and practicality, is any idea of individual, personal values of a fundamental, life-shaping nature. That's what's dropped out of both conceptions. And those are really corrosive effects of the moral practical dichotomy. Okay, so I've talked a little bit about the source of the dichotomy, a little bit about the effects that it has on one's thinking and one's view of life. Now let me say a little bit about the actual proper relation of the moral and the practical. And as I said, I want to highlight it from the perspective of the personal. That instead of a degraded conception of the practical, One should view what one is practicing with real love and respect and personal admiration. And instead of a frozen concept of morality, one should be constantly, continually asking oneself whether one's ideals are in fact this worldly, possible, and active in one's life and in one's thinking. Morality is nothing more and nothing less. I mean, this is the objectivist perspective. It's nothing more and nothing less than deep, systematic thinking about what to practice. That the whole point is to help you gain a fundamental, abstract, generalized perspective on life, on the goals to pursue in life, and what they should add up to. So morality is first and foremost about values. I think Ayn Rand's whole philosophy comes down to this idea of reshaping existence in the image of one's values. And that that involves two crucial interrelated aspects, the world and you. What work you want to do and the person you want to become. This is how Ayn Rand puts it. Quote, man faces two corollary interdependent fields of action in which a constant exercise of choice and a constant creative process are demanded of him the world around him, and his own soul. He has to survive by shaping the world and himself in the image of his values." Close quote. Now, as I said at the start of the talk, what I want to do is just highlight two aspects of that overall process, focusing more on the issue of shaping yourself or your soul. Two points of advice that I think you get from objectivism. And I'm going to put them this way. And the first combats the notion that the practical is the conventional. And the advice is, ask yourself what you truly want. What really are my values and why, and do they make sense? And the second point is to combat morality as a frozen abstraction. And the advice is, cultivate a moral sense of life. Cultivate a moral sense of life. Now, the term a moral sense of life is from Ayn Rand, and I'm, but I'm using that term deliberately to try to stress that morality should be something individual, personal. You should have an individual, personal connection to your moral ideals. And the real goal, I think, is that these two perspectives converge, they intermingle, they become united in the end in one's mind. So let me s- start by sketching these two points and then give an illustration. So the first, to combat the idea that it's the conventional of asking oneself what one truly wants in life. Do you remember what Peter Keating says about this in The Fountainhead? He's talking to Katie and he tells her, Katie, this is towards the end of the book, Katie, why do we always teach us, why do they always teach us that it's easy and evil to do what we want? It's the hardest thing in the world and it takes the greatest kind of courage. I mean what we really want, as I wanted to marry you. Not as I want to sleep with some woman or get drunk or get my name in the papers. 
Those things, they're not even desires. They're things people do to escape from desires. Because it's such a big responsibility, really, to want something. Close quote. And now, if there was ever someone who has a degraded, conventional, impersonal conception of the practical, it's Peter Keeney. And it's in significant part because he doesn't ask himself that question of what he truly wants in life. I think part of what's so personally inspiring about Ayn Rand's heroes, her positive characters, and even the semi-positive characters, is precisely that they ask that kind of question. They ask themselves, what can I achieve in life? What do I want to achieve? Why? What will it take? Is it worth it? They're not at all conventional. They're self-programmers in a deep sense. And it's because they're thinking about this kind of question and this kind of issue. I mean, think how different Rourke is from Keating in this respect. Rourke has a very specific, particular vision of what his life can be and what he wants it to be. A life of work and creativity, of designing and building, a vision of the kinds of clients he will attract and that he can earn, and of the kinds of people he respects and will seek out as he seeks out Henry Cameron or Stephen Mallory. Even Wynan, who's a semi-positive character in The Fountainhead, has a very specific conception and design for his life of what he's setting out to do. I mean, his problem when you first meet him, gun to his temple, is whether what he has done and achieved was worth it. His worry, in effect, is similar to what Keating's raising. Did Wynan ask himself the question of what he truly wanted from life? And did he have the courage to answer the question honestly? I think his view at the end is that he did not have that courage. That's part of the meaning of the final scene between Wynan and Rourke, when Wynan tells him, building the, Rourke building the Wynan building, build it to the spirit that is yours and could have been mine. But he didn't have the courage to do that. And it's the same kind of question that Keating didn't ask about himself. And if you switch out of the world of the Fountainhead to the world of Atlas Shrugged, you see Reardon and Dagny, for instance, asking this same kind of question, this kind of deep probing about their life, their lives. Reardon is asking himself why he invented Reardon Metal, what the value of his mills are to him, why he puts up with his family, what he's truly getting out of his relationship with Dagny. Or Dagny, we see her asking this kind of question, for instance, when she quits Taggart Transcontinental after the moratorium on brains is passed, and she's at the cabin rethinking her goals. And part of her deep puzzle there is that she can't see what's wrong with her basic goals in life, yet can't understand why she's unable to realize them in the world. And it's a deep conflict for her. And both of them, it's not easy for them to answer this question, but they're relentless in the pursuit of what are my goals? What do they really mean? What do they add up to? Are they, can I achieve them? Are they worth it? And they're continuously thinking about that issue. And it's that kind of activity, I think, that kind of self-reflection that Rand is telling us is necessary to have a non-degraded, non-conventional, a personal and personally meaningful conception of the practical, of what you want to practice in life. You have to ask yourself what you truly want and why. And it's not an easy question to answer, but you're the only one who can answer it. And it's a question that one should be revisiting throughout life. It's not an issue settled when you're 17 or 25. <clears throat> so that was the first piece of advice I think you get from uh, objectivism on this issue, on the issue of making the concept of practical and of practicality a deeply personal concept. It's to ask yourself what you truly want from life and to spend the time and effort necessary to answer that question. The second point was, as I put it, to cultivate a moral sense of life. And I really think of this point as a complement to the first point. In effect, the first point goes from inside to outside, from self to world of asking yourself what you truly want. And the second point goes from the outside to the inside or from world to self. 
To possess a moral sense of life is to find the whole realm of the good and of values, to be exciting, enjoyable, personally inspiring, something that you will strive to live up to in your own life. To possess a moral sense of life is to have the emotional experience that you would not dream of practicing anything other than what you view as moral. And you would not dream of morality being a scarecrow that is going to chase away your enjoyment of life. <clears throat> and that's part of what it means to have a deeply personal connection to morality. I think that is now in more conscious terms, Eddie Willer's attitude in Atlas Shrugged. It's part of his characterization, his orientation to what is right and good and to figuring what that is. Um, and part of figuring out what that is, and I think also what it means to have a part, uh, possess a moral sense of life, and that Eddie has this kind of attitude, is to be constantly on the lookout for what you think is good, is personally worth emulating, worth striving for, worth dedicating your effort and time to. And I want to really highlight this issue of emulation, because it's very different from conformity or dependence or conventionality. Emulation is the desire to embody what you first-handedly see as good in the world and in other people, to embody that within your own self, with your, within your own soul. It's in the, where Ayn Rand discusses the issue of moral sense of life is in her article, Art and Moral Treason, which I highly recommend rereading. And she discusses it there as the child's development of a moral sense of life. And it's true that immature emulation can look like concrete bound copying or conformity as a child, say, tries to fly around in a cape to be like Superman, or an adolescent dyes his hair orange to be like Howard Rourke. But I actually think it represents, and that's part of what the article's arguing, it represents a profoundly moral attitude. <clears throat> but in our culture, this attitude is all too often undercut. And that's part of what Ayn Rand is explaining in the article. And it's undercut in these, this kind of way. Here's a quote from the article. It is easy to convince a child, and particularly an adolescent, that his desire to emulate Buck Rogers is ridiculous. He knows that it isn't exactly Buck Rogers he has in mind, and yet, simultaneously, it is. He is, feels caught in an inner contradiction, and this, conforms his, this confirms his embarrassing feeling that he is being ridiculous. Thus, the adults stunt his conceptual capacity, cripple his normative abstractions, stifle his moral ambition." Close quote. And I think in today's world, the chances are that most of us have experienced some kind or some degree of stunting in this regard. <clears throat> but I think as an adult, you can try to reverse the damage. As an adult, I think you can actively try to rekindle this childlike perspective on the world and on moral values. You can try to make as a constant element in your thinking and in your outlook on life, your first-handed moral evaluations of people and events, of everything that you encounter. What do I think is good and true here? And why? What do I think is false and bad? And why? And then especially, how can I be more like the good and less like the ba bad? How do I emulate that which I personally admire? How do I emulate that which I personally admire? <clears throat> I think that is an attitude you can cultivate in life. And it's a way, in, in a way of reviving this childlike sense of life. And from a different perspective, it's just one aspect of the importance of moral judgment, which Ayn Rand stresses, um, stresses, for instance, in her answer to the question, how does one lead a rational life in an irrational society? Conscientious moral judgment of everyone and everything around you not only helps build up and preserve the good in the world, but it helps build it and preserve it in your own soul. You learn more and more if you, if you practice as a regular course of action, conscientious moral judgment. You learn more and more about what you think is good and what you think is evil. 
And notice that that's the exact opposite of morality existing as a frozen abstraction in one's mind, as an issue one no longer thinks about, no longer learns anything new about, and has no personal connection to. And I think what happens if you try to cultivate a moral sense of life, you'll find that what's merging and blending, sort of uniting in your mind, is that which you truly desire, that which what you truly want, and that which you think you ought to desire or ought to want, that both become a source of inspiration and of aspiration in your life. <clears throat> okay, so that's a little bit on this second point, on the issue of a moral sense of life and why I think it's important to, in effect, unfreeze the concept of morality and make it an issue and a subject that one continuously learns more about. So that, those are two pieces of advice, to ask yourself what you truly want, that I think objectivism is emphasizing, and it emphasizes that it takes a lot to answer that question, and to try to cultivate a moral sense of life, which in a way you can look at as trying to rekindle your interest in the good, and particularly your desire to emulate it. Now let me turn to a couple of points of clarification and then of illustration and of potential caution. <clears throat> First, what I'm stressing is that philosophy is risky. It requires real self-exploration, self-criticism, self-development. It requires real introspection. And you might not always like what you discover. Recall Rand's description of philosophy from Philosophy Who Needs It. Most of us, she says, have a mongrel philosophy, a set of ideas and premises, some true, some false, some thought through, some absorbed with not much thought, some consistent, others clashing. And she says the task of philosophy is to help you clean up your mongrel philosophy, to purify it, bring order to it, make it consistent. And that that requires introspection, real introspection. It's no coincidence that the article in which Rand stresses the importance of introspection is precisely the companion piece to philosophy who needs it, namely the article Philosophical Detection. And what I want to stress is that this picture of a mongrel philosophy doesn't just apply to non-objectivists. And it doesn't just disappear when one starts calling oneself an objectivist nor does it disappear a few years after you've been calling yourself an objectivist. <laughs> it takes time, that's for sure. But more importantly, it takes work. You have to put in the effort to think about and identify the premises and ideas you accept, why you accept them, how you hold them, how they manifest themselves in your daily thought, your desires, your emotions, your motives, and your actions, in your life and behavior. And if you don't do that, I think philosophy is too much like a top coat, too easily discarded. <clears throat> now, I said uh, towards the start of the talk that I found these two pieces of advice about asking yourself what you truly want and of cultivating a moral sense of life particularly helpful, particularly helpful points of guidance from objectivism. And as a way of illustration, let me give you an example from my own life of what this, I think this process of exploration looks like. And I'm going to take the, my choice of career, which I regard as a good choice. Um, now, in an obvious sense, objectivism has helped shape my career. I'm an objectivist philosopher, so... Um, <clears throat> but what I learned from objectivism shaped it in a much more individual, personal way. When I was in high school, I was focused on math and science courses and was set for a career in physics or engineering or something like that. I had developed an interest in philosophy, philosophy and economic issues, and I was reading about them, but I thought of it more as a personal interest, as a hobby, not as a potential career. And it was reading The Fountainhead and Atlas Shrugged and the nonfiction that led me to start thinking about, well, why do I want a career in physics or engineering? Is that something that I truly want? And, I have, and why do I want it? And I eventually decided it was for a mixture of reasons, some good, some bad. In some ways, I definitely was interested in math and physics and science, but it wasn't as though I spent a lot of time thinking about those things outside of the classroom. If I was outside of the classroom, I was much more likely to be thinking about philosophical issues. 
But I had accepted the premise that the hard sciences are objective and rational. The other subjects, not so much. <clears throat> They're more emotional, subjective, irrational. So on the one hand, I thought philosophical questions and issues were important to think about and answer. And I thought there was something strange about people who didn't ans ask these questions and try to answer them. On the other hand, I thought philosophy and the humanities more generally was unscientific subjective, which would be a pretty good reason for why people don't ask questions about philosophy. So I, and I really had to think about these issues. And I eventually concluded that the mistaken premise that I held about philosophy and the humanities as unscientific had submerged and quelled a real interest and a real desire in philosophy, something that I strongly held and had real reasons for thinking that these were important questions, at least important to me. So that was on one side, on the side more of thinking of what I truly wanted and trying to find out the premises and ideas driving me to what I thought that I wanted. But I didn't think that that was enough to choose a different career path. There's also the issue of, well, w w what I truly want, is it a legitimate career? Is it something good to do? What value does a philosopher provide? What's his function in a division of labor society? I knew some of the things an engineer does. What the hell does a philosopher do? <clears throat> and I read the lead essay of Philosophy Who Needs It many times to think about her argument of the role of the intellectual and of the philosopher in a culture and of what value he provides and whether that argument was right or not. And I eventually decided that it was right, that she was right that there was something inspiring about good intellectuals, that it was a noble profession if you could live up to it, that it was something worth emulating. And when I eventually saw that, well, what I was truly interested in and what I truly wanted, personally wanted, and what I personally thought was good and noble were uniting and converging in my mind, then I thought, yeah, that is a legitimate choice of a career and I should change career paths, which is what I did. Now, there's obviously a lot more in the... Oh, thank you. <clears throat> the, the point is not to compliment myself, though. The, the, the point is that it's these two, I think these two issues, really thinking about them in regard to one's life and what one truly wants, and what does one view as good, noble, worth emulating, are two questions one should always be asking and trying to have converge in one's mind and help set the direction of one's life to ask what you truly want, and to be patient but persistent in answering the question, and to cultivate a moral sense of life, to really try to keep alive in your mind, particularly the issue of the good and of values that you think are noble and worth emulating. <clears throat> okay. Now let me issue a point of caution, or at least a potential point of caution. <clears throat> In raising this issue, or these issues, of what I truly want and of cultivating a moral sense of life, I've been stressing, in effect, in, from a different angle, that we should be asking, what can morality and philosophy do for me? Now, I think it's important that the answer be not be, help me rationalize. And I think there's a real danger here. In her article, Philosophical Detection, Ayn Rand writes that evil philosophies are systems of rationalization. They're systems of rationalization. Here are a few of the examples she offers, but there's a whole lot in that article, Philosophical Detection. But a couple, three of the examples. Quote, nobody can be certain of anything. Is a rationalization for a feeling of envy and hatred towards those who are certain? It may be true for you, but it's not true for me. These are all the catchphrases that she brought up in philosophy. Who needs it? It may be true for you, but it's not true for me. Is a rationalization for one's inability and unwillingness to prove the validity of one's contentions. Nobody is perfect in this world. Is a rationalization for the desire to continue indulging in one's imperfections, i.e. the desire to escape morality. Close quote. And I think there's a wider point to learn here and to learn from that essay, Philosophical Detection. It's that philosophy itself, philosophy as such, 
is a handy means to rationalization. The purpose of morality and philosophy is to make sense of one's life, to provide one with a framework from which to view one, the world and one's place in the world. And it's the widest framework possible. There's nothing beyond it. There's no further subject. There's no fun, more fundamental questions. There's no further line of inquiry. In the most fundamental sense, philosophy says, this is the way things are. This is what you should do. And so as such, it provides ultimate reasons, ultimate justifications, ultimate explanations. And that can be a double-edged sword. On the one hand, it's a powerful tool to think about one's own life. On the other hand, it makes it easy to generate seemingly rational and unquestionable, but bogus justifications of one's thought and action. And I really want to, that unquestionable, that's part of the issue, that it's ultimate explanations, ultimate justifications. You can't ask any further questions about it. I mean, here are some ways you can use objectivism to rationalize, to pretend to myself that my motives and behavior are rational. I didn't fail. As an objectivist, I'm just too good for the world, which blinds me to the ways in which I could and should improve. I don't need to apologize or ever say I'm sorry. I didn't do anything wrong. I'm morally perfect, which blinds me to the wrongs, even if inadvertent, that I've committed and could and should rectify. I'm rational and fact-based because I'm an objectivist, which blinds me to all the subtle ways in which emotions can be and do interfere with thinking. I'm an objectivist. I don't evade. Other people do. Which simultaneously builds up a phony self-esteem and needlessly debases my view of other people as unthinking brutes. And you could, the list could go on and on of the ways in which you can use objectivism to rationalize. <clears throat> Let me give you an example from my own life of the temptation to use objectivism to rationalize. Now, this again, this is an example where luckily I resisted the temptation. That's not the point. The point is that it was very tempting to use objectivism to rationalize. So I was studying for my PhD. This is what, at the time when I was studying for my PhD. And I had a dissertation proposal that I was to be examined on. And if you pass your what's called ABD, all but dissertation, basically what you have left is to write the dissertation and you're finished the degree. And as normal, I circulated my proposal um, so it's a written proposal. You circulate it to the committee members. They give you feedback on it. Uh, you rewrite the proposal. And they basically decide if it's ready to pass. And the oral exam on it is basically a formality. I failed. <clears throat> One professor at the start of the exam said, well, I know I told you I thought this proposal was good, but I changed my mind. <clears throat> and the exam sort of went downhill from there. <clears throat> now afterwards, I was in the department secretary's office trying to figure out well, what the next steps are. She was a bit flustered about the whole thing, saying, well, I don't know what to do. No one's ever failed before. In my <laughs> and it, I mean, this is true. In my 28 years, I've never heard of such a thing at this university. Now, I got along well with her, so I was partly aggravated, but partly amused that somehow she had the bigger of the two problems. <laughs> but it, the point is, it was a painful situation. And there was a real attempt to evade what happened and to rationalize it. And I knew at the time the easiest thing in the world to do would be to rationalize the failure away with a convenient dose of objectivism. I know what's right and what's true and good. I've got the philosophical answers. They don't even know what the questions are. <clears throat> They're frightened by my ideas. Um, they're threatened by them. I mean, what can an objectivist do in the irrational world of academia. Woe is me. <clears throat> Much harder was to try to actually think what happened. Now, it wasn't completely irrelevant that I was an objectivist. I, it's true, I come at philosophical questions differently. I think some questions are more important than others. So there's different view, and I obviously have different views on philosophical issues. But had I made my, in the, in the 
perspective and in the proposal to the committee, had I really made it clear what my proposal was? Had I given them confidence that I had a real and delimited project? It turns out, not really. Did I bear considerable blame for the failure? Absolutely. Should they have failed me? Probably. <clears throat> now, what of them? Did they try to understand the proposal? I eventually concluded some committee members did and some didn't, and I switched out the ones that I thought that didn't. Is it irrational to change one's mind? No, depends on the reasons and the circumstances. Could the professor have done it maybe a little bit before the exam? <laughs> maybe. Um, so they may have bore some responsibility for it, but it was mostly my fault. But the point of the example is that it, it's easy to use philosophy to give you a handy means to rationalization. It gives you an ultimate answer, an ultimate justification, an easy way out, an easy way to offer oneself explanations and justifications that seem beyond question, yet are false or even arbitrary. <clears throat> and using philosophy and morality like that is neither practical nor moral. And it's not what to do in exploring these two questions of what I truly want and the question of cultivating a moral sense of life and trying to implement that. You have to be realistic in your implementation of what you regard as morally good ideals that you're striving for and not rationalize that you're living up to them just because you call yourself philosophical or an objectivist or so forth. <clears throat> okay, so those are basically the points sort of in the non-political arena, the moral philosophical points that I wanted to cover. A little bit about the source of the dichotomy in religion um, and how altruism secularizes it. A little bit about the corrosive effects on thinking that it freezes the concept of morality, that it degrades the conception of the practical. A little bit on objectivism's advice about what to do in a culture like that. And one is to build um, a really personal conception of what one regards as practical, of what one's truly trying to achieve in life, and of trying to rekindle a moral sense of life and keep active the whole issue of morality and learning about morality in one's mind. Now let me go back, as I said I would at the start of the talk, to just conclude, to return to the three examples that I promised to come back to the, from the more political arena. But as I said also at the start of the talk, Dr. Brooke will be addressing these kinds of political issues, I think, in more depth in his talk tomorrow. So I can go fairly quickly here. And I really just want to highlight one aspect of them, and that is that objectivism should be transforming in a very personal and a very non-conventional way one's conceptions both of morality and practicality. So the first example that I gave before was X is not only moral, it is also practical. What's wrong with that kind of formulation? And now I think typically, it's not always the case, but typically it concedes way too much of the wrong context. It suggests that the moral and the practical sometimes or often diverge, but happily not in this instance. It implies that morality doesn't help define what counts as practical. Indeed, it suggests that we all already know what counts as practical. That's just common sense. In other words, it typically buys into and reinforces the conventional pragmatic view of practicality. So for instance, if one says, more open immigration is not only moral, it is also practical. One often ends up conceding the bogus view of practicality embedded in the debate, such as whether immigrants contribute to the economy or take jobs away from Americans. That's not a valid standard by which to evaluate a citizen's actions. I mean, you don't look at a child who's just born. Is he going to contribute to the economy? <clears throat> Is he going to take jobs away from somebody? I mean, you don't look at that in regard to citizens. Would you look at that in regard to non-citizens, in regard to immigrants? In other words, you end up conceding the whole perspective that an individual immigrant has to justify his existence to a collective. And that's way too conventional and way too impersonal. So I deliberately put it in more personal terms. Way too impersonal a perspective. And if you reread Ayn Rand, you'll notice when she formulates a point like this, 
in the, in the terms of the moral and the practical, and she sometimes does, she puts practical in scare quotes. And the reason I think is precisely because she knows the moral practical dichotomy not only degrades one's concept of morality, it degrades one's conception of practicality. And she's trying to radically transform our understanding of both concepts. <clears throat> Take the second example. We need American businessmen to embrace their profits and just lose the unearned guilt. Now, what's wrong with that perspective? Well, I think it represents too little thinking about morality. It's, well, we learned from Atlas Shrugged that unearned guilt is a big problem, so let's get rid of it, and what else is there to do? <clears throat> but if you switch, say, from the Atlas Shrugged to the Fountainhead, I mean, this applies to Atlas as well, but just let me bring in something, the Fountainhead. Should we tell Peter Keating or Guy Franken, his partner, that they should just embrace their profits and stop feeling guilty? Should we tell Gail Winan, who is a great businessman in many ways and builds a real empire, that the solution to his problems is he knows what to practice, just stop feeling guilty about it? Not every businessman is like a Bill Gates or a Steve Jobs with a truly productive vision of what he's trying to realize. Many businessmen are compromised in small ways. And what objectivism is asking them to do is to rethink elements of their practice. None of this is to say that the issue of guilt and unearned guilt is unimportant. It's crucially important. But it's not a simple matter, and it's not the whole story. And if you're actually thinking about morality and about altruism, part of what you'll learn, and you'll learn this certainly from Ayn Rand, is altruism survives in part by grafting unearned guilt onto earned guilt. Rand emphasizes this in Galt's speech and in many nonfiction articles, that there are real causes for why people, including businessmen, feel guilty. I think it's one of the reasons it's hard to get businessmen to support laissez-faire capitalism. You could put the point this way, that there are many connections, reciprocal connections, between a compromised soul and a compromise that is a mixed economy. And this is something you can learn from Ayn Rand's writing. If you're thinking about morality as an act of concern, something that you can learn more about, and that the connections matter to you, and that they, they, then they will become more and more real to you. So it, in effect, is too, it, there's a way in which morality is frozen in that whole perspective, I think. Now take the third last example. Everyone should want to practice capitalism because everyone is better off under capitalism. Now, again, I think it's way too conventional, in this case, too utilitarian, a perspective of what we're trying to practice. Is everybody better off under capitalism? Is Ellsworth Tui, Oren Boyle, Pavel Syrov, Comrade Sonia, James Tagger, Paul Larkin, President Obama? <clears throat> Of all the dehumanizing aspects of utilitarianism, and there's lots of this greatest happiness for the greatest number principle, one of the most objectionable is its unconcern with heroes and villains, good and bad people. You're supposed to focus on trying to raise everyone's happiness, good and evil alike. Now, that is not Ayn Rand's focus. <clears throat> her whole perspective in her article, What is Capitalism?, is precisely that capitalism frees those who choose to think from those who choose not to. In a profound sense, and this is what Ayn Rand's arguing in part in that article, capitalism's ruling principle is justice. And this justice is what we should be trying to practice. So the overall point of those three examples, and really of the talk itself, is that morality should not be a frozen abstraction whose content becomes conventional, but a live, active, personal force in one's mind. And what it should be doing in a deep, fundamental way is shaping one's conception of the practical. That is of what one truly wants to practice. It's not an easy perspective to gain, I think, either about oneself and one's own life or about the world. But I think it is possible with objectivism's help. And I definitely think it's worth striving for. Thank you.
We have time for questions. Who's going to be the first brave soul? Okay. Um, can you elaborate on what you mean by conventional? Well, it's picking out the norms, particularly the part that I was emphasizing is conventional in a moral sense. So it's picking out the norms and the standards that are embedded in your society. I put it one way I put it was, when in Rome, do as the Romans do. And that this is, um, and I emphasize it particularly in regard to pragmatism. And I think this is one of the aspects of pragmatism. Both Ayn Rand and Leonard Peikoff stress, if you read, for instance, The Ominous Parallels, which has a lot of discussion about pragmatism. It's the way in which pragmatism is very secondhand philosophically, that it doesn't specify goals, values, what you should be doing, but it needs content for that. And the content then comes from other views. That is, views prevalent, dominant in the society at large. So they take over their views. Um, and that is part of what the conventional means. And it's not as though if one talks more generally about conventions, um, the established ways of doing things in a society. It's not that all conventions are bad. It's rather, to, it's one thing to take a convention as good because it's a convention, because it's conventional. And it's another thing to think about conventions and whether they make sense or not. What pragmatism does, um, and I, part of what I was emphasizing is that when one has a frozen concept of morality, it degrades one's conception of practicality and makes pragmatism very attractive as a philosophy. Part of what it does is you end up treating conventions as good because they're conventions. And so it's taking that over in an unthinking way. That's part of what I was trying to emphasize. So, so that's why you, in your example of capitalism is good because it's good for everyone, you use that as an example of grafting objectivism onto conventional ideas of morality. Yes, it's taking over a utilitarian standard that typically dominates yeah. um, arguments and discussions about capitalism and saying, or let's say about social system and saying, well, capitalism does it better. It's, it's in, you can put it in another kind of way. It's like, when they talk about education, no citizen left, no student left behind, no child left behind. Here it's no citizen left behind. And we don't care who these citizens are, what they do, what choices they make, and so on. And that's very much a utilitarian perspective on the world, not at all an objectivist perspective on the world. I can't even see who that is, but uh, yeah, it looks like Ben. Okay. Uh, yeah. Thanks, Ankar, for a really excellent talk. Um, I wonder if you would comment a little bit on the role of this concept of the moral sense of life in fleshing out the meaning of the virtue of pride. Because the way that you described it, there seems like there's a lot of overlap. Pride is shaping one's soul in the image of a moral ideal, selfishness of yes. the soul which desires the best in all things. Yes, so. and she puts it, and she even emphasizes, italicizes moral ambition when she's talking about the child. I think, yes, what there's, a, there's very much a connection between it. And it's how the proper conception of pride, and pride is a virtue, not just a sense or an emotion uh, or a perspective on oneself, but of a virtue of active action that the child has of looking. And if you think of the, particularly you might think of yourself, of children that you like, of how active they are on finding things that they actually like, exploring them, valuing them, wanting these things, never letting go of a teddy bear or something like that. Um, that kind of active orientation, both of figuring out what you want and then going after it. Um, and, and I was stressing the issue of emulation that Ayn Rand is stressing. That too of, is about, I want to be that kind of person. And that is all, I think, in issues of pride. And it is part of what, how does pride get killed? in the child. It's not just by Catholics and so on teaching that pride is evil. It is by injecting into them the moral practical dichotomy. She talks and, and it's, she brings it up in that article as well. And she calls it in a few places the lethal tenet. And it's the root, in a certain way it's the root of altruism, but it's certainly, I think her view is, that it's what people keep as sort of the first premise about altruism, that there's this kind of split, and that, and she gives particularly how parents and educators and so on cripple the child 
in his the, the development of this virtue of pride. And it, I think that's more than anything what kills it as a virtue, not the teaching that pride is evil, because it is in a certain way a healthy and normal orientation for children. And it's their first-handed conception of values and trying to live up to them. And that is, and it, the point of in art and moral tree, or one of the points in art and moral treason is that what parents and educators should be trying to do is precisely develop this and get it from a sense of light to a conceptual abstract perspective. And it would be the transition from a moral sense of life to having a proper concept of morality. And that is, her point is that that is not even, not just done, it's crippled and stymied in all kinds of ways. Sure. Uh, I had a question on the, uh, on the, uh, the, you know, how altruism uh, has, does the, um, yeah, I'm gonna forget, you know, the, um, the, the two world dichotomy, right, uh, as applied to altruism, which which is of course explains a lot and and is I think a very important point uh, to to understand uh, altruism. But um, so I, I and I haven't read about this in a while, so I'm I imagine that Ayn Rand actually um, um, brought this up explicitly uh, about that altruism is the secularization of the two world viewpoint, right? Uh, and but and the question then is uh, is uh, is this a, a development that strictly is from objectivism or were there some like Kant or somebody who actually explicitly uh, des described a kind of a two world uh, me and other right the, the the dichotomy of me versus other uh, did he actually or well he certainly has two world kinds of views, phenomenal world versus the noumenal world, and your phenomenal self versus your noumenal self, and your noumenal self in some sense giving orders to your... So there's that kind of two world view. It's a different version of the platonic two world view. But the formulation that I put as that what altruism is doing is secularizing a two world view. That's my formulation, but I think it's a Ayn Rand's point, and I think it's all over Galt's speech, and it's a crucial element of thinking of the root of altruism. And it's not an accident that in Galt's speech, there's a discussion of that, there's a discussion of the issue of original sin, and then there's a discussion of the mystics of spirit and the mystics of muscle. And it's, but it's all from a perspective of this kind of metaphysical split um, of it. It can be this world versus the next, and God is in this kind of mystical element issuing commandments or its society as that and that's part of the secularization and altruism's an aspect of that whole secular secularization of that the voice of the people becomes the voice of god um, and that's all over Galt's speech so i definitely think it's ayn rand's point i don't know that she formulates it in exactly the way that i formulated it right and, and then and of course that you made me remember but of course the kant is the originator of that right i mean Kant is with the noumenal phenomenal. He's of a two world view or of the of the, I, of the two I mean, world view that that became the secularization of of religion. Well, he's certainly secularizing religion yeah. in various kinds of ways, but he's not the only one. And particularly in regard to altruism, right. um, there's a whole way that, and this is, I mean, one of Ayn Rand's major points in Further New Intellectual, the lead essay, is that the philosophers post Renaissance would not question the issue of morality which meant that they took over the whole content of morality from religion and were secularizing it in various kinds of ways. But it was a secularization that remained, it's, it remains mystical. It's not as supernatural, but it remains right. as mystical. And that her whole view of altruism is that it is mysticism. And if you ask the question, as she puts it in Faith and Force, the destroyers of the modern world, if the, you ask the question of why about altruism, it crumbles. Um, so it's a form of mysticism. But it's the secularization, it's no longer supernatural. But it requires still this two, this split of the you and the non-you. And that is all over um, philosophy in the modern, I mean, from the Renaissance onwards. So it's not only Kant, though he certainly does a lot to cement that kind of view. So, so there, has there actually been, I, I promise okay. this little, Okay. Has there, uh, has, there, has, has there actually been somebody that spoke in that manner? Uh, you know that the, the of a metaphysical split between the you 
and others. Well, it's contained in their views. Certainly, it's contained, I mean, it's right. their the view. They're issuing a metaphysical view, whether they put it in exactly those terms right. or not. But yes, so I de definitely think that that is in the perspective. Yeah. Thank you. Sure. Let me go here, and then I'll come back here. Uh, th thank you very much for an excellent talk. Uh, I, I loved your point about uh, mo morality being a, should be a constant, constantly active issue, and how how is morality going to apply to me introspecting, uh, looking at your imperfections and working to remove them. But in talking to objectivists, uh, I'm actually, I'm a psychiatrist, so I guess you can expect me to say this. But I, in talking to objectivist friends, I find that when they look at their imperfections and want, they do want to improve them, they seem to feel like the only, basically all they need to do is to study objectivism in more detail and chew the concepts and work on it philosophically. And, and would you agree with the idea that Philosophy, may the, 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 the philosophical analysis of your own um, mor moral character may lead you to conclude that you need to do other things in psychology, get professional help, assess what psychological issues and um, uh, what your psychological issues might be, and so on. So, the implication uh, would you agree that the implication is not just that you, your moral imperfections will be removed if you were only uh, diligent enough in studying objectivism? Um, well, I wouldn't put it exactly on the issue of moral imperfections, but if one's thinking more generally about one's character and how one's, if we put it more broadly of one's character and how one is trying to improve and things one is trying to get rid of, because there's a certain way in which the moral issue, if you're trying, it might be hard to do, but morally, if you're trying, that is what is important. Um, but it, that, yes, can there be psychological and even psychiatrical kinds of issues that you will run up against that you would need professional help? Yes, I actually think, though, the direction goes more from it should be when psychology and psychiatry, if, if one thinks they're not yet sciences, fully sciences, are on the way, I mean, Ayn Rand's view, at least at that time, was that they're, there's, we're gathering the evidence from which a future science will come. You might think now it has reached the stage of being a science. That it should come from that perspective of when you need professional help. Psychology and psychiatry should be giving some advice of when you would need professional help and when you wouldn't. In the same way that you can pick up, I mean, I have a book at home about um, sort of first aid and beyond. And it's, well, if you have this symptom and this symptom and this symptom, call the doctor. If you have these ones, go to the emergency room. Um, that it because part of the perspective is that this is what the knowledge we have, this is what we would be able to do. So to lend some of that, it's not all just from the person's perspective of, well, I guess I need a therapist now. Um, but, I, but I definitely do think, and part of what you learn from objectivism, is there's a lot you can do on your own um, and a lot of thinking. But it's not just, it's not sitting down and reading an essay. It can be partly that, but it is actively trying to work on these things. Um, that requires real action um, on one's part, and it can it, trying to break habits and patterns and so on can take small actions to try to address this kind of issue. You'll have setbacks and failures, but I think what's important is you're trying to address the issue and you're making some improvements. So, and so I think there's a lot, even if we're saying, well, what does objectivism provide that is beyond reading the essay again? Um, hello, I have a question uh, about the moral and the practical from legal uh, perspective, from uh, law. And I'm not a lawyer, so. Yeah, <laughs> it, it won't be uh, too specific. Let's say that we agree that um, imprisoning using retaliatory force against the murderer is both moral and, and practical, and necessarily practical. Um, and then it would mean that imprisoning him for two years would be, would be moral and imprisoning him for 20 years would be moral. Uh, and then I'd want to articulate my argument that uh, imprisoning him for two years uh, is not very effective or not effective enough. How would I articulate this argument without suggesting that uh, imprisoning him for two years is not uh, practical? I don't quite follow. So was the, if I got it right, the start of the example was this guy's a murderer? Yep, that guy. And it, two years is, what do you so, mean? So I'm years? saying, we agree that imprisoning a murderer, it's, it's retaliatory force, and it's moral, and it's practical. But then we have a whole range of ways to handle it, right? Which would be moral. 
Well, there, but there are many you could imprison him for uh, a certain number of years, or uh, there are a few way, ways you, in which you could handle the retaliatory force. Well, there's true that there's options in regard, and part of the design of a legal system, I think, is to make the punishment fit the crime. Yeah. Um, and there's and there's a real calibration, real thinking that which is part of the province of law and philosophy of law to think of how that whole system is calibrated. I don't think there's an optional issue about um, the guy's a murderer. Let's give him two years and six months off for good behavior or something like that. That it, it that is such a heinous crime that you lose all your rights. And it is right. you're lucky that and there can be reasons that you're against capital punishment and so on. You're lucky that you haven't lost your life. It's not, well, you only deserve two years or something like that. So I don't, uh, I, I don't see that as an issue of, I neither think it would be moral nor practical to let out murderers after two years. Right. So let's say you could, you could let, let them out there for 25 years. Or, uh, where, where I come from, that's, that's, the, um, that, that's the law, 25 years. But you could also do it for 50 years. Both would be right. But you wanna, I want to argue about it. But I don't want to say that one of them is not is not practical. How would I argue it? Well, that is part of the issue that there is optionality if, when you're designing a legal system, for instance, uh, this, this is the context. Um, there is an optionality about setting the precise um, degree of punishment for different kinds of crimes. And it's to recognize that this just is an optional issue and there might be, um, I mean, take the issue, say, of a driving age or a drinking age. Well, you could set it at 18, 17 and a half. There's a reason to set it. There's a range in which it's optional. Within that range, you can pick anything um, that are valid. It's a, I don't see a need to formulate it as an, an issue in terms of practicality. What is right. practical is to pick something within the appropriate range. Okay. Thanks. Sure. Um, so one thing I understood you to be saying when you were talking about how the moral practical dichotomy degrades the concept of the practical. Mm -hmm. And this, this is in my own words, but I think this is essentially what you were saying is at least one way this happens is that um, values get reduced or conflated maybe with um, desires or maybe what people commonly desire. And an example of this might be if you're in a situation where you could easily get away with cheating on an exam, someone might say, oh, well, um, obviously, uh, you know, they might assume that you want to avoid studying or that everyone wants to avoid working hard if they can. So therefore, it's practical to do that. And I'm wondering if you think that there might be a connection there with a kind of human view of practicality or of desires as some um, as something that it's just a means and uh, phenomena. So basically, something is practical only in terms of achieving your own goals, but not in terms of selecting goals or having an ultimate ideal that you're striving towards. Yeah, I would put it more though in terms, and part of what I was stressing is what morality gives you is a wide perspective on your life and on things to be seeking, a generalized and a fundamental perspective on what. And it helps you think about your goals, how to achieve them, what goals you should have, and how to achieve those. Um, and that the part of what happens to the concept of practicality when it's emptied of moral values is that kind of wide perspective on things is absent. And that's part of why it is, um, it's partly conventional, it's partly just desires that strike you and that's all that matters. Um, and so, so practicality was, as I put it, as Dr. Peikoff put it, is it's, it's that which seeks, uh, achieves or fosters a desired result. But it's a very impoverished view of what desires are, what they could be, how to form them and so on. So that is, re and it's relevant, I think, to the human perspective, the, because part of the human perspective, when it's reason is the slave of the passions, it's any passion that strikes you, um, and there's no further kind of perspective that you could take on anything. Um, the, you brought up at the start something about um, 
the issue of, I think, robbery or something like that, um, becoming a thief. It's important there to get that, at least, at least this is what Ayn Rand is arguing, that kind of the mechanism is in, in, in Galt's speech. I think you definitely observe the results, and it's worth thinking about the mechanism. It is that what altruism does, uh, or the morality of death, as it's put in Atlas Shrugged, or the morality of sacrifice is another term that is used, is it equates the good with the impractical and the evil with the practical. But people don't think about good and evil anymore, and in particular because altruism, it's, it is hard to swallow on its face to think what it is telling you is figure out what your values are and then slash them away. So people don't think anymore about good and evil, but they still get all kinds of data about what in fact is good and evil that is working that they're thinking about in some form in their minds. And so what happens is they think of robbery as evil, which it is, and they put it in the con category then of the practical, because I've labeled it as evil. And that's part of why I put it as they half don't believe this, because they think of robbery as evil. That's why they're regarding it as practical. And they're right to think of it as evil, but the wiring is all wrong, and so that they immediately make a connection to, well, that must mean it's practical. That is what is wrong, but that is what they do, so there's a sense in which they half believe it. And it's to get that that's the mechanism going on um, uh, and how when they're trying to explicitly think about morality, that's how they're thinking. And, how, and that's part of what I, I meant is the wires are crossed. It's that kind of pattern of thinking that's being described in Gold's speech. Thank you. Sure. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I was one of those people that thought that everything was clear, but now it's not any longer. <laughs> There's, there's a lot more well, to think about. Well, I hope it's about. not now no, it's all unclear, I mean, there's but... a lot more things to think uh -huh. about. I mean, I thought that, you know, well, life is, you know, man's life, your life is a standard. As long as you keep that in mind, everything else follows. Yet you didn't even mention that. And I was wondering, the introduction of the non-you in a way, I mean, is basically telling you, well, your life is not the same thing. So I, I have two questions. So your advice would be, is that is your advice? One well, of the things that you said that we should try to do, isn't it? Basically, to keep in mind that your life is a standard at all times. And the second uh, question I have is, how did that even? Maybe you already answered, but how did it even come up? I mean, with all this incredible thing that you know, your life is not the standard. How did that start? I mean, that now is so in, in French and everywhere. I mean, like you know, I grew up a Catholic, so of course life was not my standard. But I mean, how did that even come up? Um, so absurd. So, <laughs> am I saying, or was I trying to imply that, it, no, is it in, not important to think, well, your life is the standard? Right. Yes, I definitely right, think that right. is important. There's a whole bunch of things that I didn't stress right. about the whole view of morality and practicality in objectivism. Um, what I was trying to emphasize in regard to the you and the non-you is that people hold it metaphysically. And part of then when you're trying to, if we put it as dissuade an altruist, but just to get them to question things, part of what you're trying to do is to get them to get that this is how they look at the whole issue. And they have these two categories. And why do you have these two categories? And then you immediately put things in one and the other category. Why do you look at things like this? In effect, why is this your metaphysics? And that's part of when Ayn Rand says, the question of why will blast altruism. It's true, but it's why about all kinds of aspects of altruism. And again, in Gulf's speech, she addresses all kinds of different aspects of it. But one that I'm stressing is that there's this metaphysical way of holding things that they have that you have to get people to question. And if you have any remnant of that in yourself, you have to question. it. Where does it come from? Um, well, that's part of the issue about that it is in part, it's a, it, and, but in significant part, a secularization of the religious view. And it is um, that th there's another world to which you can focus on and owe allegiance and you should live up to, and that's what really counts. To that is, there's a way in which it is offering something and saying, well, this is the nature of reality and so on. Part of what you get in Galt's speech is the emptiness and negative and this is what, but how the non-you fits in, that the characterization of God 
is it all in terms of negatives? He's not finite. He's not limited. He doesn't think like you think. Um, he can achieve knowledge in different kinds of ways. It's all in terms of he's not this, not that, not that. The conception of society, when you get it as an organic, what, as it's in collectivism, it's the non-individual, it's all in terms of negative. And altruism is in terms of the you and the non-you. And it's characterized all in terms of negatives, and it's these commandments coming from the realm of the negative. And it's, and it's part of the whole issue of the reification of the zero in Galt's speech. But it's to get that this is all, there's something very much in common with this whole view, and it is the negation of the positive. Um, but in religion and even in collectivism, there's more of a, of a seeming positive. Altruism, and it's part, I think, in which it's sort of the dead end of these views and of the culture, and one of the ways Ayn Rand puts it, it's the vampire haunting Western civilization, because it's been torn away from these other negatives, and yet still lurks, and it is everybody's reaction of, yeah, what about the non-you? And, that, and that's what has to be blasted, but it comes from a wider perspective of a whole way of looking at the world, I think. Thank you. Thanks for watching. Be sure to subscribe and ring the bell to never miss a video.